here we go. Back on my paper on the French Revolution um, when, I was, when I was a sophomore at Harvard. Um, um, I, I chose to write about um, Jacques-Louis David, the, um, the French painter, and how the French Revolution affected his art. And I think it was because this painting was in my local museum, the Albright Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo. Um, but I'm not really sure. It's just a painting that I grew up with and I always liked. Um, I'm an archivist or a pack rat at heart, and I still have the term paper that I wrote at the time in which I said profoundly, wartime presents numerous problems to the culture of a people living through it. How's that? Duh. The profundity of a college sophomore. I proceeded to discuss the gradual engagement of the artist in the political events of his time. Today, we might call it co-option. In any case, after 1789, David turned into a somewhat different painter from the one who painted the 1782 Buffalo portrait of which I was so fond. As luck would have it, during that same fall semester of 1956, the distinguished Charles Eliot Norton lectures were being presented at Harvard by Ben Shawn. I was familiar with Shawn through one of his paintings at the Albright Art Gallery in Buffalo, but also because I had gone through a Howard Fast period in high school. Um, some of you have probably been through that as well, reading every one of Fast's historical novels. One of them, The Passion of Sacco and Vanzetti, was among his then most recent books, and I took an interest in the fate of those famous anarchists. Um, and I had encountered and, and had encountered uh, Ben Shahn's memorable images that subject where he was very famous for, the, among other things, for this painting. So Shahn was sort of a hero to me at the time. I thought I would do research for my history paper by asking Shahn his thoughts about David and art and the French Revolution. He seemed so delighted to see me in his upper floor office um, at the Fogg Art Museum that I suspect he had few visitors. Um, I don't recall that he helped me much with my term paper topic, but he did discuss the role of art in politics. And he told me that my friends and I should be more politically engaged. This was in the middle of the Eisenhower administration, remember, and most of us were incredibly uninterested in politics of any kind, probably because it wasn't all that much after the Army McCarthy hearings of 1954. It was also the autumn of uh, the 1976 presidential election campaign. And I thought that going door to door in Cambridge on behalf of Adlai Stevenson constituted serious political activism. Ben Chan was only 58 at the time, but sitting in his fog office, he seemed like a very wise and very old prophet. He wanted to move me toward political activism, arguing that silk screen printing was the easiest and most efficient means of communicating political ideas with images. He offered to teach silk screening to me and my friends. Kirkland House, where I lived, purchased the equipment and Sean came over several times to teach us. But apparently it wasn't our time for politics. We ended up using the silk screen materials to make posters for Harvard Radcliffe orchestra concerts and Valentine's for our girlfriends. This all came rushing back to me less than a decade later when I was living in Berkeley. Silkscreen art was the primary means of creating the slew of political posters, a lot of them are now collector's items, about the free speech and anti-Vietnam war movements, as well as for the burgeoning world of rock concerts, of course, at the Fillmore Auditorium and other such venues. In retrospect, I now see that the political and social ferment of the late 60s created serious conflicts for artists. Those few with a reasonable amount of critical and financial success were made to feel compromised by their too close association with the institutions like museums and schools that were under attack. Most of the artists I knew in my California days had firmly staked out anti-war positions, but few of them expressed their politics through their art. One of them who did was Peter Saul whose many Vietnam War inflected paintings sent powerful anti-establishment message, establishment messages while at the same time assuring Saul of an honored place very much on the margins of the mainstream. In the decades since then, this very productive painter was shown only sporadically 
and a recent, well, actually current, Peter Saul exhibition at New York's new museum demonstrates what a loss this has been for the range of art visible in our museums. Unfortunately, like all the other museums, the new museum's closed right now. Working in a wholly different mode, but also uh, somewhat sidelined from so-called mainstream art, was the Chicago painter Leon Golub, whose anti-Vietnam War themed paintings are part of a large body of work that also confronted other political issues, such as racism and sexism. Since his death in 2004, Golub's work has had increased visibility, including an important uh, 2015 exhibition at London's Serpentine Gallery, which I was lucky to see. Golub was among those who founded the Artists and Writers Protest Group in 1965. AWP was one of many such protest groups, included, including also the Art Workers Coalition. In 2019, the Smithsonian American Art Museum mounted an exhibition and published a catalog on this subject, Artists Respond, American Art in the Vietnam War, 1965 to 75. But in 1965, New York, there was a New York Times full page ad posted by the Art Workers um, Project that the Times stated, we are grieved by American policies in Vietnam. We are opposed to American policies in Vietnam. We will not remain silent before the world. Among the artist signatories were Leonard Baskin, Elaine de Kooning, Robert Indiana, Agnes Martin, Robert Motherwell, Mark de Suvero, Ben Shan, Isamu Noguchi, et cetera, et cetera. That may now sound like a distinguished list, but it doesn't compare to the high profiles of the celebrity writers who signed. Hannah Arendt, Kay Boyle, Evan Connell, Jason Epstein, Howard Fast, Joseph Heller, Shirley Hazard, Leslie Fiedler, Robert Lowell, Malamud, Arthur Miller, Philip Roth, Susan Sontag, et cetera, et cetera. I'm citing these names, it's not inclusive here, to make a point that of the signers of that ad, the writers were generally more high profile than the artists. Also, interestingly, there were very few music people among the signers. The composer Ned Roram is a rarity here. Only a few art critics also. The writer Dory Ashton and her husband, the pa painter Aja Junker signed, but Dory had long been associated with left-wing causes, so that was not a surprise. It was also not surprising that the only high profile art museum cur curator, the only high profile art museum curator to sign was Peter Sels, then a curator at the Museum of Modern Art and soon to move to Berkeley, where I joined him um, a few years after that. Sels had challenged the then wholly abstractionist canon in his radical 1959 Museum of Modern Art exhibition, New Images of Man. But interestingly, while his catalog essay alludes to the artist's work as a response to 20th century political upheavals, Sells was more interested in placing those works firmly within art historical contexts. Seeing the artist as overtly political would presumably have been unseemly. Not surprisingly, this MoMA exhibition coincided with my late 1950s non-political college days. That, of course, was the legacy of the McCarthy era. It surely cast a pall over large swaths of the cultural world. Still, certain kinds of controversy were considered acceptable for some reason. For example, the outrage that accompanied pop arts assault on the supremacy of abstract expressionism and the so-called triumph of American painting, uh, Irving Sandler's term, that was permissible because art historical mythology asserted that the new guys, remember they were usually guys, challenged the establishment before themselves becoming the establishment. Supposedly that's the way culture moves forward. Just check out the opposition to the Paris Salon system, for example, or Picasso and Brock and Cubism, or Duchamp's urinal. But art politics isn't the same as politics politics. The politics both in and of art has a distinguished history. It even includes weird concepts to which most of us no longer subscribe, such as the primacy of Italian art over German art. We still live under the force of that prejudice, by the way, which is evident in the collections of most American museums, where German art holdings you may have noticed, or maybe you didn't, are relatively weak. 
It's a bias that predates World War I and war-generated political anti-German feelings. Indeed, a reaction to that kind of art politics is what underpins the founding at Harvard of the Bush Reisinger Museum in 1901. And it's still, I think, the only American museum broadly devoted to the art and culture of German-speaking countries. But the McCarthy era wasn't about esoteric and highfalutin issues like the triumph of Italian art. Given the complex history and e economics of the Depression era, a lot of the American cultural community writ large, as well as the labor movement, found aspirational ideas on the left, and some in the Communist Party itself. Many, but not all, had abandoned those illusions following revelations of Stalin's Moscow show trials in the late 1930s. Others retained their political commitments, but didn't necessarily act on them. Trying to lay low was an understandable reaction on the part of artists and many others. Presumably folks in the cultural world were expected to follow Peter Pan's advice. Think happy thoughts and not get too involved and maintain a low profile. If you didn't personally know someone whose professional life had been destroyed by the Red Scare, I actually did know people, you had, actually, you had certainly read about it. After all, only a few artists lived solely from the proceeds of their art sales. Most of them had other gigs and the luckiest ones had teaching positions. Putting those jobs at risk was done at one's peril. The Red Scare underpinned an especially insidious kind of suppression. And while its effects on the performing arts, especially film, is usually more publicized, the world of visual arts was affected as well. There aren't too many examples of direct state censorship in our country, although we've actually seen recent reminders that it still exists here. But something much more insidious and therefore not visible has always been lurking at times of political unease, self-censorship. That's especially problematic in fields where the economics of survival can easily be imperiled. We seldom know about the decisions of museums and exhibiting institutions not to place something on view. We know very little about the walking on eggshells that may impel directors or curators not to engage with art that makes potentially controversial political statements, or how many decisions are generated from fear of trustees or funding sources such as donors and politicians. It's only the sporadic public squabbles that come to our attention. As early as those squab these squabbles was the project that artist Hans Hacke undertook at the Guggenheim Museum, one of the early ones in 1971. It was called Shapolsky et al, Manhattan Real Estate Holdings, a real-time social system as of May 1st, 1971. Hacke was outing, as it were, a notable New York City slumlord. The museum's cancellation of the exhibition, well, that's one form of censorship, became a cause celebre and was very embarrassing for the Guggenheim. And of course, there's the memorable green flag lithograph flag moratorium that Jasper Johns printed in 1969. But its restrained elegance clearly made it an acceptable, polite kind of Vietnam War protest. And it was, after all, by Jasper Johns. Retrospectively, some of these protest works gain interest and even sad resonance, as was evident in the 1988 exhibition of graphic political art organized by the Museum of Modern Art. It's called Committed to Print. The exhibition was wide ranging and included work by over 140 artists and artist groups. But it was mostly celebrating a lot of political protest art that had limited visibility when it was actually made in the heat of the controversies and seeing it in a polite historical museum exhibition had already fossilized, fossilized the messages in some ways. That was also true for a related exhibition organized by the Whatcom Museum of History and Art in Bellingham, in Washington. That 1990 exhibition, A Different War in Vietnam, covered much the same territory as the MoMA exhibition with many of the same artists in a wider range of mediums. Looking back at political issues of the past is presumably easier than engaging with them in the present. Leon Golub and Peter Saul, by the way, were among the artists included in both of those exhibitions. While the late, late 1980s controversies surrounding the funding by the NEA uh, for, of exhibitions by Andres Serrano and Robert, Robert Maplethorpe generated outrage on both sides, 
I see that as more a matter of funders, what we used to call patrons, calling the shots uh, as to what they want to pay for, rather than outright censorship. One is reminded of Daniel de Volterra, who was commissioned in the 1560s to cover up nudity in Michelangelo's Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel, earning him the nickname Il Bragatoni, the Britches Maker. Theoretically, those who can pay decide whether or not they want to pay for it and what, how much they'll pay for it and whether they want it changed. That's generally been the case for patron, with patronage, however much it may stick in the craw of the patron's beneficiaries. Nevertheless, examples of more direct censorship or threats thereof have been around recently. Most of us remember when Mayor Rudy, Rudy Giuliani threatened to close the Brooklyn Museum's 1999 sensation exhibition because he was offended by the elephant dung used in British artist Chris Ophelia's Madonna painting. Now that's censorship, or it would have been if carried out. Even more recently, the National Archives fudged a photograph from the 2017 Women's March on Washington for an exhibition they were mounting. But tracing the source of that change was next to impossible. Did it come from somewhere in the Trump administration from fear of retribution, or perhaps in the senior management of the archives? In any case, it was a blatant example of self-censorship. Self I mentioned of the self-censorship I mentioned earlier, except that in this case, the press had alerted us to it. The Library of Congress pulled this photograph that was to have been in that same archives exhibition because of its anti-Trump imagery. On January 30th of this year, Martin Levine in the Washington Post described the situation perfectly. Both organizations censored themselves without being asked to do so. Of course, power operates best when it remains invisible. Presumably, there are countless examples of self-censorship constantly underway, but we don't know about them. On the other hand, some political statements in art end up being widely celebrated. It's probably fair to refer to Picasso's Guernica as the 20th century's most iconic political painting. The painting has long been celebrated as an assertive visual communication of the ways in which war has an impact on innocent civilians. But I would argue that despite the clearly evident and readable anguish in the images in Guernica, some, someone who doesn't know about the Spanish Civil War and the bombing of the Basque town of Guernica on April 26, 1937, wouldn't necessarily have any idea as to why these images are expressing such grief. I don't mean that as a criticism of Picasso's immense achievement, but I think there's a real difference between art that makes direct political statements and that in which the message is both generalized and more oblique. Among the most imposing indirect political statements in art of recent decades are Robert Motherwell's series of paintings, which he called Elegy to the Spanish Republic. He completed over a hundred of them between 1948 and 1967, supposedly as a quote, lamentation or funeral song after the Spanish Civil War. I can't be the only one who wondered at the connection between this art and that war. As the Museum of Modern Art tells us, quote, they have various associations, but Motherwell himself related them to the display of the dead bull's testicles in the Spanish, Spanish bullfighting ring. The artist described the elegies as his, quote, private insistence that a terrible death happened that should not be forgot. But he added, the pictures are also general metaphors of the contrast between life and art and their interrelation. Motherwell's elegies span the same era in which Boris Lurie was producing artworks with considerably less subtle intentions of making political statements. Overt political statements have been problematic issues in the mainstream American art world for some time, certainly since World War II. At about the time I was being taught silk screening techniques by Ben Shahn in 1956, I made my very first art purchase from the Gropper Gallery in Brattle Street in Cambridge. They were showing etchings by Francisco Goya and I bought one as an anniversary gift for my parents. Um, 
I said I was a pack rat. You can see my pack rattery behind me. I've even unearthed correspondence with my brother, urging him to send me his half of the price of this etching because I really needed the $12.50. I'm assuming it's a later print pulled from the original plate, but I've never had anyone check it out. I recall that I found the image, Yolo V, I saw it very moving, although I had no idea what it was about. And I don't recall even trying to find out. It was probably pure coincidence that the Goya etching dealing with the Napoleonic Wars related directly to my term paper on Jacques-Louis David. I think I was too naive to make the connection. I should add sort of parenthetically that the Gropper Gallery also showed the very political and now mostly forgotten artist, William Gropper, presumably a relation of the proprietor, although I'm not sure. William Gropper was never a member of the Communist Party, but he did contribute art to communist publications. And in 1927, he even went on a tour of, the Soviet, of Soviet Russia, along with the novelist Sinclair Lewis, Sinclair Lewis and Theodore Dreiser in celebration of the 10th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. So of course, Gropper was called to testify before the House on American Activities Committee in 1953. That experience provided inspirational fodder for a series of 50 lithographs entitled Capriccios, which was clearly an homage to Goya's series of the same name, Los Caprichos. Art historian Fred Licht makes a strong case that Goya may be considered the first modern artist, comparing him to the best photojournalists of the last decades. Certainly Goya's engagement with current events was evident in the series of etchings, Disasters of War, of which mine is one. It was hanging in my, I say mine, it was hanging in my parents' living room until they died and I now have it. Licht writes that the artistry of Goya lies in the indomitably sensitive perception that functions even in the face of the most sickening heaps of mutilated corpses. And he rejects the artist's prerogative to do anything but bear witness. One can even argue that my etching prefigures some of Picasso's imagery in Guernica. Uh, take a look, if you look at the figure on the uh, left in the Guernica, you can see that uh, there's a relationship to this mother and child in the Goya etching. But Goya was working on this disturbing series of images depicting the Spanish War of Independence against the French while keeping dutifully silent in his role as the Spanish court painter. The etchings weren't published until 35 years after the artist's death in 1863, when it was politically safe to do so. And while Goya's majestic, his, and his majestic and assertively political firing squad canvas, the 3rd of May, 1808, is brutal in its sensibility, it was painted in 1814 as a commemoration of Spanish resistance to Napoleon's armies during the occupation of 1808 and the Peninsular War. It only appears to us now as an eloquent political howl. Probably the most overtly daring political 19th century artist was Honoré Daumier. His caricatures, many of them published in Le Charivari, were scathing satires about judges, defendants, attorneys, and the corruption of society in general. Daumier's lithograph, Rue Transnonienne, 15th April, 1834, depicted a massacre that was part of that month's riots in Paris. Police discovered the print and then tracked down and confiscated as many copies as they could find, along with the original lithographic stone on which the image was drawn. Few examples of the original survive. Despite white admiration for an artist like Daumier, the mainstream American art world has long been uncomfortable with artists who incorporate direct political statements in their work. That includes a number of significant American artists whose work sits in major museum collections, but is seldom on view. So they generally appear as footnotes to the history of American art. Among the, them are the aforementioned Ben Shawn and William Gropper. Others include Jack Levine, who you see here, uh, a painter with both personal political commitments and exceptional talent, as well as Philip Evergood, one of the most prominent of the group of artists frequently referred to as social realists. Many, perhaps most of these artists were Jewish with personal roots in the social justice concerns that often motivated first generation Americans. But aside from their being out of step with prevailing abstract styles, their art was likely tainted by the notion 
that there might be a connection with what was officially social realism in the service of political power, namely Soviet art. Philip Guston, who's better known for his abstract expressionist paintings on the seductive cartoonish realism of his late work, wasn't generally grouped with these artists, but Guston too had roots in politically charged images, as is here evident in the extant 1930 drawing of a Ku Klux Klan meeting. Safer artist statements, which we may now interpret as subliminally political, of the so-called American are the so-called American regionalists, who were especially active in the early pre and early post World War II years. But while today we might view the paintings of John Stuart Curry, Grant Wood, and Thomas Hart Benton as suggesting something like "Make America Great Again." they have remained a very resonant sidebar in American art. Many of these painters have also been subject to the occasional revisionist reappreciations of their work, as was evident in the extensive and popular 2018 Grant Wood retrospective at the Whitney Museum. And remember, in our admiration for his drip paintings, it's easy to forget that Jackson Pollock had studied with Benton at the Art Students League in 1930, and had also participated in a 1936 workshop given by the very political Mexican muralist, David Alfaro Siqueiros. Uneasiness with outright political statements in mainstream American art remains a contentious issue. A momentary attempt to shift that view was evident in the 1993 Whitney Biennial, organized by a group of curators, Elizabeth Sussman, Thelma Golden, Lisa Phillips, and John Hanhart. That exhibition opened to fairly scathing reviews and may go down in history as the most reviled of those every two year attempts to summarize American art. In the New York Times, Roberta Smith wrote of the biennial that instead of a frequently docile presentation of market trends like so many of its predecessors, this show takes a distinct position. It focuses on a range of art that is more or less political or at least social, paying scant attention to anything else with its persistent references to race, class, gender, sexuality, the AIDS crisis, imperialism, and poverty, the work on view touches on many of the most pressing problems facing the country at the dawn of the Clinton administration and tries to show how artists are grappling with them. The wall labels and texts are ripe with fashionable buzzwords, identity, difference, otherness. Critic Eleanor Hartney described the biennial as social work or therapy with pieces that were numbing didactic and said that too many of the most prominent works simply target the white male power elite as a source of all evil. In 2017, Amelia Ames, looking back retrospective at that exhibition as a watershed moment, suggested that critics felt the work was too directly political and social in its content and too ephemeral in its composition, leaving no room for the privileged space of neutral aesthetic contemplation that the modernist white cube had always provided critics in the past. In the Times, Michael Kimmelman wrote at the time of the biennial, I hate the show, calling the art grim, political sloganeering and self-indulgent self-expression. Critic Robert Hughes said the show was a fiesta of whining and preachy and political. And Roberta Smith's final statement on it was that the Biennial, Biennial too often loses sight of the fact that art is a form of visual communication that must exist for its own sake before it can further a cause. In the end, this ambitious show illuminates the pitfalls of politically inclined art far more than its triumphs. It's against this background that we need to understand Boris Lurie's considerable achievements. Having survived several concentration camps during the years 1941 to 45, as you heard, Lurie, Lurie clearly arrived in the USA in 1946 as a seriously scarred man. Obsessed by his personal experiences, he regularly, regularly incorporated that brutal history in his art. Early work even included remembers, remembered experience in the camps and in that way shares sensibilities with other so-called Holocaust artists, and even with art that was produced in other, not necessarily comparable places of incarceration, such as the Soviet Gulag and Japanese internment, American internment camps. 
Yet Lurie isn't among those artists who are often lumped together as quote unquote Holocaust artists. Those artists, some of whom produced work that survived the camps, even when they didn't, have been sporadically shown in this country since the mid 1970s when I organized the first American exhibition of that work. But Boris Lurie spanned various art worlds, just as his work synthesized a wide range of ideas and techniques, making him very much an artist of his time. He clearly reveled in what we now call mixed media, for lack of a better term, feeling free to use whatever materials, paint, paper, wood, metal, would provide him with the effect he wanted. Having managed through both his father's and his own financial acumen to accumulate considerable wealth, Lurie was also freed from at least some of the pressures that hound most artists. He managed to live both in and apart from the art world of the 1950s and 60s. Evidently, Lurie didn't need to participate in the clubby cedar bar atmosphere that critic and my late friend Irving Sandler described so vividly in his 2003 memoir, A Sweeper Up After Artists. I was only just beginning my journeys in art in the early 1960s, and insofar as the latest art was concerned, I was very much under the sway of my boss at the Jewish Museum, Alan Solomon. Solomon, a major influence on Leo Castelli, had managed to make the Jewish Museum the most happening art place in 1960s New York. I'm sure that at that time, I thought I knew everything that was going on. Still, I don't recall having heard of either Boris Lurie or no art. That's clearly a reflection of my youthful limitations and the narrowness of the art world I inhabited. Irving Sandler does, in fact, discuss Lurie and his art, if somewhat dismissively. He writes, I never quite figured out where to fit a half dozen or so social protest artists within the New York school who, in the late 1950s, formed the No Group. Although they were heavily influenced by Rauschenberg's combine paintings, which you see here, this notion, uh, although they were heavily influenced by Rauschenberg's combine paintings, this notion of who was the first to do something fascinates me. Art historians, especially those folks who trade in discussions of modern and contemporary art, for them, the issue of first is critical, although it's generally couched in other terms. The question about the direct influence from Rauschenberg to Lurie came back to me this fast, past February when I happened on an exhibition at London's Tate Britain, Nigel Henderson and the Art of Collage. I'd never heard of Henderson, but was intrigued by his use of collage imagery in ways reminiscent of both Rauschenberg and of Lurie. Here's Rauschenberg, here's Henderson. And I was reminded that while we persuade ourselves that we're really looking at art with an educated neutrality, we're mostly comfortable with what we know. Some artists who challenge that take on heroic stature become the next stature, become the next new thing. But most artists, earnestly slogging away at their work, can only hope, likely in vain, to get noticed, and then if noticed, perhaps accumulate accolades. I'm a great fan of Irving Sandler's, but like many critics, he was especially partial to the artists he knew personally. On the subject of Boris Lurie and his fellow no artist, Sam Goodman, Sandler continues that they pieced together junk collages that were explicitly political, sexual, and scatological. They were stylistically familiar, however. They were brazenly perverse and nihilistic. There was also nothing subtle about the titles of the no-shows, such as Vulgar and Doom. Goodman and Lurie invited me to write about their work, but I begged off because it looked too derivative on the one hand and on the other, too obvious. Obvious? Forget about Goya and Daumier. By the mid 20th century, art was meant to be evocative. Expressive was acceptable insofar as it described an artist's style, but certainly not his political ideas. However, in fairness, Sandler, critics, Sandler cites critic Tom Hess, who wrote in 1962 that Sam Goodman and Boris Lurie are true social realists. They comment on the disgrace of society with the refugee materials of society itself, fugitive materials for fugitives of our great disorders. Sandler concludes his no art comments by writing almost ruefully, quote, in retrospect, however, no art was ahead of its time. 
It anticipated later perverse and abject art that reflected our miserable 20th century and particularly the Vietnam War era. I'll close with this. Pete Seeger's riff on Ecclesiastes, you all remember, to everything there is a season, feels like a way to end this. We continually have new contexts in which to view the, uh, we view art and more, more on Seeger, turn, turn, turn. Um, it may suggest that we do the turning and expand our ways of seeing art, or it may suggest that it's Lurie's turn to get some serious attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'll get off of this. Oh, end show. There we go, end show. Am I back on the screen? Mutes. Are we all right? Yes, fine. Um, all right, I've, I've unmuted everyone now, except those who- Am I on the screen or is the, are the-, are the uh, Yeah, you're there. Okay. All right, so could, who, would, who would like to ask questions? Let's try to not uh, talk over each other, but um, I'm sure that people have comments or questions about what Tom said. Well, all right, so I'll ask the first question. Tom, how do you, where would you come down in terms of Lurie's, I mean, did, did he have influence? To, people did know about his work at the time in the 60s. Well, clearly, I mean, look, I, I as I say, I didn't, but that doesn't mean anything. Um, but Irving Sandler obviously did, and he was keeping up with everything that was going on. And I think that, I think, um, I think that's quite interesting, actually. Um, is it actually uh, really clear that uh, Rauschenberg came first and then Lurie came second? Well, I think it's not particularly, but I would, you know, I'd have to, I, I, I think that I would call that into question, but I didn't, I wouldn't want to make uh, statements on it because I, um, Lurie's, I, I haven't seen enough of Lurie's early work to know you know, how the dates are. I think there are a lot of things that happen, happen simultaneously, you know. Well, that's what I think. And I'm not sure that Rauschenberg was first. The other thing too, in Lurie, he was more in work camps and concentration camps, which is different. Well, you're right. You're right. I take your good, good, good correction. Thank you. Um, don't you think, oh, may I ask something? Sure. Yes. Thank it's you too. It's really um, a sliding, um, uh, sliding scale, thanks. Uh, in terms of um, what's political, what's fiercely political and propagandist, and what just shows a very strong point of view and that politics uh, colors it. Um, and I'm even thinking nowadays, like you could take Horace, let's say black artist, Horace Pippen, let's take, and Kerry James Marshall and Kerry, Kara Walker. Kara Walker, the, sure. The, the scale it, it can go for more gentle and mark on what a political situation is and then go to a really very strongly felt and, and transmitted point of view. So, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely it's right. complicated in terms of really propagandistic. Uh, to but, where, but the thing is where that line is and who, and who feels, you know, who feels that something is is over the line, you know, is, is on where, what do you mean about a line? line? Well, in other words, what, you know, what's propagandistic to one person, you know, I, I can see people thinking Kara Walker's work is propagandistic um, and other people thinking it's not. So that's why I think um, the whole issue is, is fascinating because it has to do with, you know, how far you're going to, you're going to um, feel someone is, it's okay for someone to go. And I think the Whitney Biennial is, very interesting as a as a moment in time in that regard. Well, if you put down as Kara Walker, let's say uh, Carrie James Marshall. Okay, if you put down what what you're observing and what you're seeing as a situation, and yet what the situation is is blacks being I don't know lynched. Um, at what point you know it, it's 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 tricky. I, of course. I mean, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not, I'm not making statements that it's, that it isn't. I hope, I hope I didn't sound like, like I didn't, I didn't 
think it was very, it is very tricky. I'm actually, but what interested me in this, and I, uh, you know, I keep saying, I'm interested that I never heard of Boris Lurie when I was first, when he was first brought to my attention. Um, it, it, that interested me because I really was in the middle of what I thought, I would have thought I was in the middle of everything that was happening in the New York art world in the 1960s at exactly the moment when he was active. And I'll tell you, like, how did I miss this? Well, I think I missed it because, you know, the quote unquote mainstream art world um, didn't deal with that. You know, uh, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, I want to th thank you and uh, Charles for bringing up the subject of no art. I think it's really about time and I think it's really important that you do. Also, you have to, I think, remember the Jewish context at that period of time. I mean, the Jews and the Blacks were kind of similar in terms of uh, social progression. And to bring up the subject that Lurie was doing, the Holocaust and that, which was basically a taboo and a somewhat secret uh, uh, subject. Absolutely. To have, to have somebody throw it in everybody's face, like with a shit show and other shows that Boris was doing, was a complete insult to all of those people who were progressive and trying to move up the social ladder. So it was wrong time, wrong place. But thankfully, you and Charles are starting to bring that dialogue now, finally, into uh, into public uh, view. I, you know, I, th I think you're. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, look, today you could have a show called the Shit Show, and nobody would blink. Okay, I mean, nobody would would care. I mean, many. when I was growing up, my mother had my mother who learned English in the United States swore like a sailor, sailor. And in the 1940s, my friends loved coming to my house because nobody else's mother said shit regularly. And you know, today, today it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't really mean anything to anybody if somebody says shit. So, you know. And a work camp or, or a concentration camp, the shit house was sort of the safest place to be to talk because no guards would want to be in there hanging around with people that are talking. So it was also kind of a safe zone. So there's more sort of, aspects to the shit show the one could first <clears throat> on the surface. Well, also remember Holocaust interest in Holocaust didn't come until after that. Okay. It was all you know that when in the in the fifties and sixties, that was before the kind of mania over Holocaust stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So um, it was a hidden subject. It was taboo. It was like the shit show. <laughs> Uh, here, here's a photograph of Boris Lurie and Malcolm X. Wow. Wow, that's great. This is 1964 at the Militant Labor Forum. Wow, uh, terrific. <laughs> well, that's great. I don't see it. Now, now I, it's, it it's, uh, uh, I, knew, I knew Boris through Peace oh. to the Peace and Freedom Party, which he was a member of, yeah. uh, along oh. with... Um, uh, Seymour Krim, and uh, which uh, segued into the Art Workers Coalition. So he was extremely active in all of these left organizations, Art, um, Art Workers Coalition and a Museum of Project of Living Artists. And he actually wrote one of the, um, he testified at the Art Workers Coalition Speak Out. I think it was in 1969. And you can actually go online and read all of the testimony that was presented here. Uh, but I think it's often overlooked that uh, Boris was active politically in the late 60s in Art Workers Coalition, and I've never heard much reference to it. And also, the idea that he was ne uh, neglected in his lifetime is sort of contradicted by his relationship with Arturo Schwartz. That's, I, I agree with you. I think that's very, that, I think that's, mm -hmm. that is very interesting. Exactly. Uh, but, but he doesn't Schwartz. come up, all, Arturo Schwartz is very celebrated. How come Boris doesn't come up in that context? Uh, okay, so this <laughs> is what we talking about in Israel. Arturo Schwartz's origin was, uh, he was an uh, Alexandrian Jew, and he was first brought to, uh, to art by reading the manifesto of uh, André Breton, Diego Rivera, and Leon Trotsky. Uh, he refers to it in some, uh, we're talking about Alexandria in 1949, and under Nasser, he left and became a, a big, a uh, curator of surrealist art in Milan, and he's still with us, as far as I know. But, yes. but interestingly enough, when he contributed his whole artwork to the 
Jerusalem Museum, he stripped out all of the Boris Lory stuff. Did that's he really? Right. Except that's that, really except interesting. Gold, except for the gold. I have no idea what he did with this stuff, uh, but he was one of the big, he was one of the sole collectors of Boris Lory, and he promoted him. I think Excuse there was a show in Paris in which 10,000 people came to a Boris Lory. That's right. Uh, no art. Uh, uh, the Doom, I think they recreated the Doom show in Paris. 10,000 people came and like uh, uh, Sartre was there and, and, then, and, and then Arturo Schwartz seemed to have just dumped him and yeah. dumped, dumped his collection. That's interesting. Thank I think it was one that. piece That's of gold shit that was in that. And I think it'd be interesting to ask Ar Arturo Schwartz to this day, what did you do with all the Boris Lurie's paintings before you gave them to the Jewish Museum? Excuse me, can I just say something? The yeah. Israel Museum, Arturo's collection, the pre-World War II part of it went to the Israel Museum, the post-World War II went to the Tel Aviv Museum. So I'm not sure what happened oh. to Boris Lurie's. But no, it's quite I'm possible not, that they are at, sure. the, at the Tel Aviv Museum. Maybe it's and Arturo a is alive and well. He, I saw him in Milan. Uh, we should, uh, that's uh, interesting. I'll check, check that him. out, whether it's hey, in Tel Aviv. Yeah. What did you do with all the Boris Luries that you collected? <laughs> what did you do with them all? That's yeah. really interesting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow. And I, was, I always wondered because I, I knew about the Arturo Schwartz collection, and Arturo's collection is so important. And yet, Lori somehow disappears in the ether, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, it might be in Tel Aviv. It, the Boris yeah. Lurie's might be in the, in the Tel Aviv section. You check that, Joan. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, may I make an observation? Uh, may I make an observation? Yes, of course. Oh, hi. I'm, I'm Mary here. Uh, one of the things that intrigues me is when the mention of 10,000 people coming to any art event that has a political aspect to it, that seems like amazing. And yet, when you go to Mexico City, to the Palace of, of Bell Art, or you go to the National Palace, you have art spread across it's the wall clock. that engages thousands of people. So I guess the, the question of what is the venue for political art. Now, obviously, murals are an easier way to reach a more popular base, but I was thinking that I think we have in, in other cultural contexts examples of how you stabilize a vision that was revolutionary and still is. And I mean, you can't look at Diego Rivera's murals in the Palace of Bell Arts and not feel the political power or the national palace. So I just wonder, you know, are we talking about something makes it into the world because it's at MoMA or the Whitney? Or what do we want political art to do? And whom do we want to reach? I mean, when I see people standing there not looking very privileged, staring at Diego Rivera, I have to say, that's another vision of political art and how you reach the audience. Well, it used to be, but remember, it used to be that, that artists that were influenced by the Mexican muralists were, I mean, some of them were among the people who decorated post offices and public buildings yes. during the double WPA program. Most, during of, those the depression, no, of, most of those are no longer visible. And in any case, most of those artists are not highly regarded. And the ones that were, that, that, were highly regarded later on were ones who took on other modes of art. In other words, not you know not things that expressed the kind of um, feelings that you see in the Mexican muralist. It's just not the, the the mainstream you know museum and and art critical world simply doesn't ex does has long not accepted that as as really important. But well, I understand that, but I'm I'm sort of ch challenging the idea of what do we mean by political art and who does it reach and how does it reach it. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not celebrating Soviet realism or I'm, I'm just saying that, that I think there's a lot of muralists and, and as you probably know, many cities 
have programs where kids just get that bucket of paint, you know, and create very powerful and provocative images or outsider art for that matter. So I, I think I'm just suggesting a deeper inquiry or a, another kind of inquiry into art venues and political that, art. That, that, I just that that's part of why I use the term, um, you know, the politics of art, um, because because a lot of these are these are political issues that are about the politics of art, not about politics, if you will. <laughs> right, but, but what I'm saying yeah. is there's a political issue that that rests in the question of what venues are sanctioned as legitimate. Absolute, that's absolute, all. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yes, but Tom, wouldn't it, and, and Mary both. Was, <laughs> you know, in 1932, <laughs> in 1932, Stalin made socialist realism the official uh, of the Soviet Union. And after World War II, socialist realism was no longer accepted in the U.S. museum. And that, That's right. And that, right. right. And, and the CIA and so was involved was a very, in all the abstract art. Right. Exactly. Right. But before the war, it was perfectly acceptable. I mean, all of the WPA art, a lot of it was in that style. Right. It was covered up, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, there's plenty, there's, you know, there's plenty been written about, you know, about this, you know, what, I mean, I, I still like Irving Sandler's term, the triumph of American painting, but the point is, there's a lot of it been written about it and about, you know, whether or not um, it, it relates to the, po to the Cold War politics, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have a, you know, I grew up on that stuff and I still like it. I don't have a real view of of it, but I think that some of the arguments about it in terms of of uh, the Cold War are, are very interesting. And and, mm -hmm. and there's no, if I might say so, no, absolutely the push for the Europeans rather than uh, and burying the Americans. They wanted. To I think uh, if yeah, if I may inject a, um, a comment, I think the focal point in the United States came in 1932 when uh, Diego Rivera was commissioned to Lincoln Center mural. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's precisely, not only was it uh, uh, political, but him putting uh, Lenin at almost the center of the mural, to the right of the mural, pretty much made it clear mm -hmm. that that was, no doubt, a piece of political mm -hmm. art. Yeah, that was probably a watershed, I think you're right. That's precisely. Yeah. Yes. I think that's the moment after which uh, big purses decided, hey, this is not the kind of art we need. After mm -hmm. that, the mural was destroyed. I think uh, up to that point, there was a plenty of sort of uh, playing with uh, social mode and realistic art and commissioning that, et cetera. And I think uh, uh, after 1934, when the Rockefeller was very displeased with that mural, after that what happened, there was a clear turn towards sort of commissioning more abstract, non-political uh, uh, non art. And suppression of political art became pretty much uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 what they wanted, so to speak. And you probably see the movies, the, uh, Batiste, Matanto, the, and the Europeans. Yeah, the hands that rock the cradle, you probably saw the movie. Yeah. There was a whole movie, you know, about it. But, uh, well, I mean, I think I think that's a good point. I, th I thank you for that. That's very yeah. Yeah, well, um, I'd like to interject something. Um, I'm Karen Butfreund. I'm a activist and feminist curator, and uh, have uh, worked with Charles for a number of years. And first, I want to say thank you so much for your talk tonight. This was so interesting. But I have to say, as an activist curator, I'm really encouraged about the number of nonprofits and small art centers across the country that are having political art shows. Mm -hmm. Literally, like I was um, a, uh, asked to jury an exhibition on censorship in, in St. Louis. There's, and that's just one tiny example of like hundreds of exhibitions. And so for the contemporary scene right now, there's two, uh, one organization and one individual artist that I would highly encourage everyone to look up. One is the artist uh, JR. He is a Parisian artist that does massive um, photographic installations all over. Like most recently, he had one that he paved all around there, like portraits um, that people take, he prints, installs. And this one was uh, put around the Louvre in Paris, 
and it was literally gone in like a half an hour or in a day, half a day. Um, but his work is amazing. So what he does is he crowdsources people to whatever their subject matter is, whether it's gun violence, domestic violence, immigration, he, they print all the photographs and then people wheat paste them in their communities on rooftops, on buildings, on streets, like the first one I was talking about at the Louvre. So to me, it's, this is a cross between political and social justice work. And so it's sort of a fine line of like social justice artwork that focuses on themes to create a better world or just political, but I think it's so close you can't really discern between the two. And the second organization is called Four Freedoms. It's F-O-R, Four Freedoms. And Hank Willis Thomas, amongst others, are in it. And they've been doing, um, and all of this has really sprung out since Trump got into office, since 2016. But what they're doing is billboards, yard signs, exhibitions all around the country. and. So, um, you know, are we going to see these in big museums? I'm not so sure. But mm -hmm. the ground, the smaller organizations, I'm, it's, it's really fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, you know, oh. I, think, I think that Thanks. we're living in, a, in, a, in an interesting time. I mean, terrible time, but an interesting time politically. It would be interesting to see whether it's it picked up by so-called mainstream um, organizations, you know, because I'm glad you brought that because there is a lot going on outside of the mainstream, outside yes. of the organizations, yeah. Uh, but let me ask this, one of the problems is that artists can't sell the work. I mean, I, they have no way of making a living from it, from it because nobody collects it. I mean, which is I know. A, Mm -hmm. Problem. I, I mean, well, that's the age old problem, Charles. It's like, it's, yeah, it's like it's so difficult. I mean, there's yeah. some artists, like, say, like Fabiana Rodriguez, who sells prints, you know, they'll sell small things, but not like the, the it does have to be more like Kara Walker, who's already in museums who are, who people will buy her other work, but they're not buying like this super mm -hmm. politically or like hard hitting work that talks about, you know, rape or domestic violence or, you know, what happened to the black violence. But that's, why, but that's why major art institutions have a responsibility to do wider range of, um, to deal with a wider range of, of material rather than copycat each other. But basically right. what's done in one institution is done in all institutions. I mean, all the major, all the major art, you know, I work in them and run them, but yeah. all the major art museums basically you know, they're they're kind of a, a copycat system, and then there's the rest of the art. Then there's the rest of yeah. The art. But you also have like uh, court cases, and I've had a number of uh, court cases where I put in art that goes into the court case, and often the judge will uh, will lock them down. Uh, what do they? And the other thing is, I've had some that the judge said they all had to be destroyed, except one for the record, because I saw court cases as permanent but they're not permanent because they'll also put them into lockdown so nobody else can see them. And also, he's also, like Judge Leger of 500 Pearl Street, federal case, said that uh, all the collages must be destroyed except for one for the record. So even court cases really aren't, you know, I had the vision that it would last forever, but they don't. Well, so here's a question I wanna throw out and I really think does it just come down well of course everything comes down to money but like say the people that sit on the board of directors are have deep pockets and very often they're right-leaning they're republicans and so they sort of they they control the spin because like for example lisa phillips of the new museum you know, I worked with her on one of my shows and for a Rose Beer of MoMA were, you know, with her and like many others like that. And they have, they're super interested in the subject matter, mm -hmm. but, but does it really just all come down to that? It's like the board of directors are going to be like, no way we can't do a show on the environment because, no, you know, no, I work I, at Exxon. No, I, you think think? Giving, I think you're giving too much giving too much credence and power to the, to the board of trustees. You think? I mean, okay, yeah, so that I was think, a, okay. I think the responsibility, the responsibility lies with the people that um, 
dare I dare I say what I really think? Um, oh, do please, because I really want to know. know. Um, you gotta remember that that the 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 response yeah, the trustees rarely get, I'm really I think they rarely get involved. Maybe the Museum of Modern Art, but by and large, in my uh -huh. experience, in my experience, trustees never got involved in what was shown in any museum that I was involved with. Okay. Okay. That. Well, that's that's but good to know. But, it, but, it's, the, but it's the it's the staff and it's the director, and you've got to remember uh -huh. that the senior positions in museums are now held by people who are getting uh, corporate salaries. So yeah. I, that doesn't, I'm not trying to negate your point. I'm just saying that the, 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 corporate, the corporatization of the whole system has radically changed since I worked in museums, okay? I was, I was, I was adequately compensated when I was running museums, but I recently checked my director's salary um, against what directors are getting now. And it's very interesting. You know, it's like a, a fraction. And I was, well, I, you know, I raised a family. I had kids and lived in a nice house and all that stuff. Um, uh, my, my, what I was being paid when I was a director was a fraction of what um, museum directors getting paid because they're trustees. My theory, this is my theory, okay? Uh -huh. My theory is that the trustees won't respect the director if he's not ripping them off the way they rip off their corporate boards. So, yeah. Um, but doesn't that, I, I hate to interrupt here because I think this illustrates perfectly your earlier argument, Tom, mm. about self-censorship. Yeah. Uh, do yeah. you think that that at the top and the decision that there is this self-censorship, well, you're making buckets of money, you know, it's yeah, a different yeah, absolutely. sense of what the mission is. And, and the same with artists. I mean, from my end, I know young artists in MFA programs, and let me tell you, they all want to do political art, and you know what they're told? You'll never make a living. And I mean, it's a tension at both ends, mm -hmm. and I think it's self-censorship all the way up and down, and I agree with you. And the question is, how can an institution like the CCPA, you know, open up that conversation about self-censorship and create well, a... All, and all it can do is... You know, if you look at Deitch when he went the to MUCA, <laughs> if you look at Deitch when he went to MUCA and he brought out the uh, graffiti show, and that was the most attended show ever at that museum, which made they, meant they made a lot of money, and they basically threw him out. It wasn't about money at the door, it was about politics, and it was about saving Absolutely. the old, art that was in the museum. And the word I was looking for with the court cases before was sealed. They sealed those cases. I had a lot of police cases, they're sealed. Mm -hmm. So anyway, and uh, you know, my shows at the modern have been in the basement. So, you know, that shows where that goes. Anyway, I gotta go. Um, I mean, I think, look, it's an interesting, I, I, I think that what Char, what the reason I, want, I wanted to engage with this, because I have a lot of respect for what Charles is doing. And I think that it's an important, um, you know, it's an important it's an important venue, and um, it maybe it can only be done in kind of independent guerrilla sort of places. That's precisely what uh, Boris Lurie was writing about about yeah. the art yeah. institution being basically ex extension arm of the art market. And as not, not, of, yeah, but he 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 was lucky he didn't have to deal with that shit, you know. But he still sort of, you know, he tried to deal with this system early on, and uh, uh, he gave early analysis of the system as it was forming in the early 60s. And that's precisely what he's saying. You have a basic paradox between creating art of protest and then not finding, you know, and then, uh, but then how you sell it, right? So it's like this stuff is mostly, for very few exceptions, is not, uh, is not sellable art. But the situation we have that it's basically, art market or deaths, you know, things that not getting, getting picked up or preserved by art market or by some sort of private foundation like Boris Lurie work, uh, falls through the cracks and basically disappears. Right. Yeah, right. That's, the, uh, that's the basic reality. I mean, he was lucky because he didn't have to worry about, you know, he didn't have to make his living having shows. So he could do, he, he had a kind of independence. Most artists don't have that independence. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. But then when somebody else, what do you say to young artists, to artists it's like, hey, we want to do this kind of start out. Oh, they have, there is no guarantee they will sell basically anything. And this is reality. They can get a grant or a show along the way here and there. But uh, the chances are extremely slim for to make a living on it. And that's the grim reality of it. That's how it is. Can I ask a question? 
Yeah, how would you go about um, finding those folks, those artists who defy the arts, defy the odds, and beat the system, and do political art anyway, because that is their calling. How do you support, find those people and support them? Well, let me tell you, if you support us, <laughs> we're, for, we're, we're, we're not gonna be around much longer if somebody doesn't support us. So let me tell you, they, they, we get, I get, every day I get another artist sending work and, and asking me to look at it. I mean, you know, you, and not all of it's great, but some of it is it's quite good. But you, you know, we have to exist. I just put that in because otherwise it's not going to be shown anywhere, mm -hmm. or not it, not in Washington anyway. Not anywhere. I mean, it's not going to be shown in New York either. You know, institutions are institutions are are cruel places. You know, they're not they're not nice places, <laughs> and they have you know, and and frankly, you know, the the world we're living in at this particular moment is going to make you know all that much more complicated. I'm not exactly sure how, but it's, it's cl clearly things will be much more complicated in many ways. Yes, but our compassion ship has been awakened. I think that's true. And I, and I think politicization may have been, uh, may, you know, may, may have been legitimized in some ways. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that's very possible too. I mean, it may have a, it may have a good impact on this. Mm -hmm. and I don't know whether it will on Charles's venture, adventure, but but on artists doing stuff in reaction, mm -hmm. yeah, sure, it's possible. Well, I think I more artists will be motivated to do it. I think more artists will want to do it and will do it. Whether mm -hmm. they'll be shown anywhere is another, you know, question. Mm -hmm. Well, for the last 40 years, at least, university art museums, because typically the directors report to the provost rather than a board of wealthy people, have been places that have shown independent things. Um, if you want to see one site where you can regularly see political things, there's something called Graphic Witness. And it's all graphic art, which makes sense if people are trying to sell difficult ideas, they're more likely to sell them as inexpensive prints or as graphic novels. So they have a regular, um, it's a place you could see, Sue Ko shows there, she made a very specific decision not to sell expensive things. That's yeah, it's a good cool. example. I have one but right the, outside where I'm sitting. <laughs> yeah, she's terrific. You can buy her, and you can buy her prints off that site for $20, $75, whatever. I mean, her entire life is a political decision, yeah. understanding that wealthy people are not going to buy what she's doing. But what if we had a Green New Deal what if we did something like they did in the 30s and we really pushed that through so that young artists could live and they did it in the 30s? Why can't we push for that now? We desperately need it. Young people are graduating or growing up into a recession or a depression. We need a national program, but we can start in New York State. Well, there actually was a program in the 1980s as well, the Creative Artists Public um, Project that supported a lot of artists as well. It's much less well known than the 1930s. I think um, moving, sort of building on that, you start to see as people are sort of constrained in what they can do, that maybe this is optimistic, but there is a sense of the inquiry into what's meaningful in life. And I think when people think that they can't go to a symphony or an opera or a choral, they're starting to say, oh my God, you know, the arts bring meaning. Now, maybe they won't, but, but many different venues are celebrating people's tiptoeing into the art world as a place that gives more meaning than, you know, going and buying a billion commodities on Amazon. So it might be a time for such a green new deal, an art new deal, whatever we want to call it, because I think people have been so jarred and shaken and art is one of the ways that people put the pieces back together. And so I think, I mean, I don't think it's that naive to say something might happen, but you need institutional support for that to happen. And I think whether it's the small museums that, you know, have been discussed pre previously, I forgot your name, or, you know, that there's already bubbling up things. And 
who knows? I mean, it's a gig economy. Artists are giggers. You know, new ways to think about the whole nature of labor and what gives labor meaning. Hmm. Yeah, well, do you think the person in the White House right now is going to be favorable or going to support you? No, but he's not going to be around. <laughs> no, I hope not. He needs boots on the ground. ground. That it's a moment. It's a generative moment. And art's going to have to process it and churn it anyway. And I mean, that's what we're going to see forever. For the rest of my life, it's going to be, you know, the, the pandemic art. So, I mean, get so, ready. So do you think that great art will come out of the pandemic? And if it does come out of the pandemic, how will, how will the art world be there to receive it? Hmm. Question. That's a really, that's Tricky. a really interesting question. Very tricky. Right now, right now, the, the, art, the art world point, basically is- At this point, when you talk about COVID-19, it becomes global. Mm -hmm. But you know what, when you talk, when you use terms like the art world, and I use the term all the time, so I, I don't mean to be critical. Um, uh, you know, it depends on what you mean. I, I, as many of you probably do too, you know, I get various, um, sites that track what's going on in the art world. And um, I basically read very little in them because they're all about the art market. They're not about art, okay? Mm -hmm. and almost everything you read about the art world is essentially about the art market. <laughs> There's almost nothing about art. You know, how many, how many, how good the sales were at Christie's or Sotheby's or how much this sold for or whatever the fair, whatever's happening to the fairs, they're all being canceled now. And you know, when the fairs will come back, <laughs> online fairs and galleries getting together to sell works together. But, you know, there's nothing about art. It's all about selling art. And that's all anybody seems to care about. And that's it's a funny. great point. Maybe because I'm, maybe because I'm a, you know, I'm a really old fart, and I don't have to engage with this stuff. Um, I just find it very boring because I'm still interested in art and not in the market. I don't, I'm not part of the market. I don't do the market. Well, there's this whole stream of videos that come through, which include art and music, ballet, and so forth. And so they are continuing, and these are private individuals or ballet companies, the Paris uh, Ballet, for instance. They all have you, has anyone seen that? And uh, the, and we're talking, I know we're talking about visual art, but still, uh, mm -hmm. people are in the art world, uh, they they do paintings and they have uh, changed them so that they're amusing and their their comments about what we're doing today alone by ourselves mm -hmm. and um i have, i have a little um i have some hope mm -hmm. that some interesting things we can produce during this well I, but i'm watching i'm watching the met the met opera things you know and um and so my wife is probably still on um, in another room, you know, she says, oh, we don't have to go to the opera anymore because we, 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 we only went to a few HD things. And now she's saying, the HD, you know, this is so much better than the Met. I don't agree at all. I don't agree at all. There's nothing like the magic of actually being in the theater. And I, you know, so I, for me, I love seeing all this stuff, you know, in, in, on my television set. But it doesn't, to me, it's a completely different experience from sitting in the, in the opera house. I'm, I simply want primary, I want primary experiences. I have another question, one more question. How can we call, make a call out, a shout out to artists and say, while your task is sleeping, this is the perfect time to put some, some meaningful art outside. So that, so that, um, you know, so that it that it could bear witness to the times. Yeah, prob probably you have to live in a neighborhood where it's allowed. <laughs> no, real. Well, for example, I live in an apartment building. Okay, I can't. I if I hung, I there were I can't remember what it was, but but there was a time when people were putting 
put in, I think it was a Trump thing, you know, stuff outside there. I don't, I don't think I could feel, I'd be allowed to hang, po you know, banners outside my windows. Forget about art, but you know. I remember, I remember when they were bombing Syria and, and uh, one morning everybody woke up and there were beautiful images that an artist had painted on buildings and it uplifted the entire, it, it, it uplifted the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, I think I think your point, point's well taken. Yeah. Absolutely. Tom, could I ask this? Could I ask this question? Um, when you were at the Smithsonian, had something? This business with the with the uh, removing the portrait or the photograph of the women's march and and or mm -hmm. brushing out all of the anti-Trump posters. Karen, Karen, Karen. Yes. Could you mute because we're hearing your your. Uh, oh. Um, I'm it's so random. sorry. Let me put myself on mute. I'm like oh. doing gardening. That's all right. <laughs> we like saran wrap. <laughs> um, who, has, who couldn't live without saran wrap? <laughs> so, Tom, do you think it's how how significant or is it? The, they would feel that they had to, you know, they're afraid of the White House. They're afraid of this president. I mean, no, I mean, I look, I can only speak to when, I, I don't know anything about the Smithsonian. When I was at the Smithsonian, I was in the middle of huge controversies. It didn't happen to be about art and censorship, okay? So I was never, well, sorry, that, that's not actually, it wasn't censorship, but I was there when the Museum of American Art had, had their huge thing about the West as America, um, which generated all kinds of, crap um, in the press because it, you know, yeah. taking a different look at 19th century American uh, painting and, and the political implications of it. Um, but I was directly involved in the Enola Gay controversy. That's not an, that wasn't an art controversy. And that was certainly censorship since the exhibition uh, that was planned was canceled. And I ended up being the curator of the exhibition that the bottlerized exhibition that actually uh, took place. But that wasn't about art censorship, that and the Smithsonian deals with that all the time. That is, um, you know, historical, uh, you know, telling stories that are problematic. And I've discussed that elsewhere. I've written about that. You know, why, for example, you can't do anything religious in this. You know, they, they stopped. My son got up. My son for his bar mitzvah got a Hanukkah menorah from one of his teachers. And it was from the Smithsonian, and I wanted to. But when, but when I was there, some a few years later, I wanted to buy one for a present for someone, and the shop no longer sold it because they're not allowed to sell religious thing, items, because there was something against selling religious items. So then, I, you know, okay, you can't do religious things, but um, and you can't, but the and you can't have the creationists telling you what you can or can't say about, anthro you know, cultural, physical anthropology and stuff like that. On the other hand, across the street at the Indian Museum, you get creation stories, okay? So it's all kind of, you know, it's very fucked up in terms of, of you know, where the lines are drawn and what's allowed and what's not allowed um, and where the politics start and where they end. There's, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing simple about it. Well, I think the people are, the artists are going to get out and uh, really do something about uh, the situation right now in this country. I think uh, Trump has, is uh, committing suicide. I think we're going to take Her over. Lips, I think we, have, we should have the courage to go out and do mm -hmm. our thing. Mm -hmm. Bravo. I second that. I have to say that Tom, after Trump was elected, my friends and I were complaining, complaining, and Tom said, stop being a talkivist, start being an activist. And so I did. And so did my college roommate, Barbara Esther. He just signed off. He's doing it 24 seven. But mm -hmm. Tom really motivated me and mm -hmm. joined me in some of the postcard writing too to get out the vote. Mm -hmm. It works. All right, well. I can't stand all these people just sit around complaining and they don't do anything. 
I don't have, I'm just looking around my room. I don't have a lot of political art. I've got masses of art here. I don't have a lot of political art um, that I'm looking at, but I have something from East Germany. I have an art from a prisoner. Does, a, does prison art count as political art? I have something, I have something that was done in a prison that a prisoner sent me. And I have something that was done in 1969 in Prague that shows uh, a foot on a head, which is done after the uh, Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. That's all the political art I have right in front of me. But Sukho is right outside my door. Mm -hmm. um, Could you show those two works you just referred to, Tom? Oh, let's see, I have to unplug this. Oh, shit. Um, okay, wait a minute. Um, yeah, hold on. Okay, here's the... Here's the, can you see it? It's way up high. No. Tilt it. It's an etching. You see it with a foot? Oh, right. Yeah. I, I'm holding, it's out way up high in the room. I can't see it, but you know, I'm just holding the computer up. Um, what else? And the prison art, <laughs> the, pri the prison art is way up here, those little squares. Wow. And the East German art is this little desolate scene. Anyway, but I, there's a lot of art, but not a lot of political art. Um, uh, <laughs> but I was, I was very good friend with a, a, a good example for me um, of this discussion about artists and politics. I had a really quite good friend named um, Tom Lewis. He was one of the Catonsville Nine. Is there anybody here old enough to remember mm -hmm. the Catonsville Nine? Um, anyway, um, and he lived in Baltimore, and when I moved to Baltimore, we became good. He had just been released from prison, and um, we became quite good friends. And then, coincidentally, he moved to Worcester, and I went to Worcester, um, and we remained friends. Now, he was a guy who was a quite competent artist, but he was such an activist that he spent most of his time getting arrested at nuclear sites and stuff like that. Um, and other than the illustrations for the books that, that the Berrigan brothers wrote. Um, he really didn't produce a lot because he was, he was overactive. <laughs> he was always in prison um, and didn't have a lot of time for his art. <laughs> All right, well, it's 9.30 and um, I think that we are about, I think, we, I think it was a very interesting discussion. Uh, Tom, thank you very much for a very interesting paper, and I, I think it's, I don't know, I hope that it begins, I think it's begun a conversation here, and maybe it will, you know, maybe more will come as a result of it, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank, thank you. you all for thank, you, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. And Happy yeah, birthday, Charles. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was great. Thank really you. Terrific. Thank you. Bye. Wonderful. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.